I mean, you've got to remember, they're not like a domestic pig. Right. They're, they're a wild animal. By the 16th century, the indigenous species of wild boar in England had all but died out. Like today, wild boar herds had to be imported from the continent. I think basically it was down to the amount of damage that they did on the land right. to crops and fields. You know, they can do a tremendous amount of damage in one evening. Yes. Um, landowners really persecuted them and uh, forced them to extinction. Yeah. Of course, you've got the depletion of their natural habitat as well, the forests being used for charcoal burning and, of course, for shipbuilding as well in the navy of the yes. 16th century. That's right, there'd be less and less places for them to sort of hide out in. So what does, what does boar meat taste like? It's got its own uh, distinct gamey flavour. It's a lot stronger than commercial pork and it's very similar texture to beef, really. Right. And it's also a lot redder, darker meat than the uh, supermarket pork. Today, wild boar meat is back in fashion. Anthony has agreed to part with one of his stock boars for the feast at Haddon Hall. <laughs> I've ground all the sugar down and all the almonds and I've beaten the two together with just a little tiny spot of rose water like it told me to in the book. And I now have March pain. Perhaps you might know it as marzipan, all that work. <laughs> anyway, you can see I've got great big lumps of it. And now I've got to start moulding it into the shape. So, clear myself a space. What I plan to do is a sort of big circle flat cake, um, sort of that deep, I hope, if I've got enough marzipan. Um, and then I'm going to ice it and hopefully gild it. And there's going to have a little tree come out the centre. And this is something I've seen described in period recipes. Let's see how I get on. I'm just sort of, I think I'm just going to start by putting on a, and seeing that I've got the thickness and how big I'm going to be able to make it. Trotters have been boiling in the copper for the last eight hours, and Fons and Mark are now able to start the arduous process of making their jellies. The moment is a bit like soup. We want it clear, so we're going to have to sieve over and over again to get more and more particles out of the water. And then hopefully we'll be left with a very gelatine-rich water, which, when left to cool, should sit hard like a jelly. I'm going to make an icing out of... Um sugar and egg white, which I've sort of just beaten up a bit together. Um, I'm going to mix them onto something fairly wet and then I'm going to um, paint it on with a feather. Ruth continues the delicate task of icing the march pane. In the kitchen's game larder, Alex is skinning a deer in preparation for the feast. He's being helped by local butcher Michael Shirt. So what we're doing here is the legging then, Michael. That's correct, yes. What you have to do is leg the animal uh, and then hang it up by its haunches uh, so you can remove the skin in one clean piece because apart from the meat, which is a valuable part of the carcass, they also used to cure the skin and make a deer skin rug out of it. Right, so, so no part of the deer would be wasted? Not then. at all. Apart no. from the hooves, maybe? No, no, they could, they'd even probably boil them up and make glue out, the, out of them. Right. In the 16th century, few meats were as prized as venison. If you were invited to the Lord's manor, and the Lord was serving up venison at the table, he's trying to tell you that he's powerful. You know, he's rich, he's wealthy, he's high up the social order, and, and of course, he can hunt as well, which is a privilege that was only extended to the very, very upper classes. Right, and you need to twist it round, Twist it round, yeah. yeah. Lovely. Right, so, let it go. A minute. We've already taken out the, the insides, haven't we? Right. right. What they call grolicking, by the way, uh, which you take the intestines and you also take this out, which is the pluck. Right. We've got the windpipe here, uh, and then the lungs, right. the heart and the liver. You see, these are the, these are the umbles, are they, or the humbles? That's correct, yes, which they used to give to the 
uh, the peasants, the people lower down the, the down the scale. So people lower down the social order would yes. get to eat the the, the, the humble, humble and, yeah. and that's the where the uh, the phrase to eat humble pie comes that's from. Correct, yes. To be humble. Uh, now we've legged it. This is the next process. We're just going to pull the skin straight down here, quite swiftly, and, and leave the carcass behind, and hopefully have a nice clean skin. Okay. So if you'd like to get hold of that, Alex, there. Get hold of that. And... Yeah, and pull it down. Lovely. Oh, Lovely. There we are. Lovely carcass of venison there. That's basically it. Just need to debone it now and it's uh, ready for the spit. That's right. In the main kitchen, Fonz and Mark are still straining the gelatine. <laughs> Even making jelly is hard work, isn't it? Yeah, and that's the whole point. Because not all the food's expensive because of where it's come from. Some of it's expensive because of the labour involved. So it might only be pig stroppers, four man's food, but two people, that's you and me, have got to do this <laughs> for hours just so they can get a plate of jelly. Hence why we're doing it for a feast, not a kid's party. Yeah. <laughs> in its day, Haddon Hall was one of the grandest houses in the country reflecting both the wealth and extravagance of the Tudor upper classes. To understand more about its culinary past, Ruth has met up with local historian Mary Lloyd in the hall's magnificent long gallery. Oh, isn't that? That's the boar's head, isn't it? That, isn't that the Manners family? Well, it is the boar, but it's the Vernon family who built the house. Oh, right. There's our peacock oh, up yeah. there. Oh, isn't that lovely? I'd never have been allowed in here, would I? I mean, you know, 400 years ago, I wouldn't be allowed anywhere near the place. Sir John Manners and his family were living at Haddon Hall in 1590. The family still own the house today. Oh, well, we have some of the original orders for food. So these are, these are food lists? Yeah. From here, yes, of about the date we're doing. Yeah. Oh yeah, look, let's see. So John Manners. Oh well, well, that pretty much dates it, doesn't it? it? Does, yeah. Three dozen chicken, eleven dozen pigeons. Oh, there's loads Three of stuff. Three barrels of oysters. Three barrels of oysters. Well, I suppose they were cheap in those days, well, weren't they? Were. they? Wow. Five udders. Now that's a little more unusual. Yes. <laughs> Just by the sheer quantities, you know, they've got to be. Some special event, aren't they? John Manners' father-in-law, Sir George mm. Vernon, he was quite a one for throwing feasts because he was known as the King of the Pig. He was oh, known was for he? his hospitality. Mm. So he was probably known for giving banquets left, right and, and centre. centre. Yeah. <laughs> the great feasts at Hatton Hall were famous. A portrait from the period depicts the Christmas revelries in the Great Hall. According to legend, it was during a feast that Dorothy Vernon, younger daughter of Sir George, eloped to marry John Manners. Their children became the Dukes of Rutland. There's this sort of tradition this, in this house yeah. of large-scale entertaining. Mm. Oh, fantastic! It's the end of the working day for the team. Time to take some well-earned rest and for the workers at Haddon Hall, it's a chance to eat a dinner of humble pie. Just the humble pie. Humble pie. Yeah. Humble pie. Go on, who's going to be brave and cut it open? Go on, Alex, go on. Quarters. <laughs> <laughs> so you take the top off, it's and we get way. a stunningly good pie. Yeah. Good mm. rosemary flavour. Mm. It's nice, that is. I like that. very nice. The team are settling into their new roles, but they still have a lot of work ahead of them. You know, we've got to the end of today and everything we plan to do is done. Is done. Yeah. Yeah. How's, your milk, how's your jelly coming on anyway? Good. Yeah, yeah. good. You it's... seem confident, he didn't seem so confident. I'm eternally <laughs> confident. <I'm laughs> <laughs> A new day at Haddon Hall and the team must start by gathering together more ingredients for the feast. Kitchen staff relied on the estate itself for all the fresh produce they needed. Ruth is raiding the hall's herb garden. The herb garden would have been absolutely central to a, a, a great estate. It's not only for food, and of course that's very important, um, to have fun and interesting food. You also need your herb garden for things like the insecticides that keep your house clean of pests, things that keep smell at bay, for cleaning agents. It's a pretty huge list, and without it, it's quite hard to see how a Tudor household will function. An enormous variety of different herbs and plants were used in a Tudor kitchen. Much of their food was preserved with salt, 
so powerful flavorings were needed to disguise the taste. But herbs also had other valuable properties. Of course, these plants were eaten not just for their flavor, although that's important, but also for their medicinal properties. Um, the, the theory of how the body worked in the period said that everything had to be in balance and that there was four basic humors, um, blood, phlegm, yellow bile and black bile, and you had to have this perfect balance, that's what health was. But each of us individually all had a different balance, so men are different from women and young are different from old and people with different colouring are different from each other, so I'm ginger, that means I have a lot of the yellow bile, the, the hot, dry collar. I'm choleric by nature and therefore hot-tempered. I would need to make sure that I didn't eat too many hot, dry foods. So not much mustard or pepper or horseradish, but lots and lots of cool food. So I should be eating the angelica along with lettuce and celery and things like that, which were considered to be cooling and calming. It would make me a nicer person all round. <laughs> To cook the large number of dishes they're planning for the feast, the team will use a huge amount of fuel. They need to restock their wood stores. You think of all the many fires they've got over at Haddon Hall. Back in the 16th century, they would have used an enormous amount of wood. Think you've got fires for cooking, fires for heating, fires for, for keep boiling water as well. I mean, you've basically got fires running pretty much every day of the year. On the other side of the estate, Fonz has come down to the river with local angler Richard Ward to try his luck at a spot of fishing. You really must stay hidden. They're using a rod and line similar to that used by anglers in the 16th century. It, this, this is pretty typical of a slightly upmarket rod that the Tudors would have used. They've been around for oh, at least 100 years and the, the butt section that I'm using here is made of hazel. Yeah and it has a slice taken out of it up here at the top so angular cuts, and then yeah. i've got a section here of blackthorn which is very springy resilient wood which you yeah. fasten together and i've got linen thread which is waxed with beeswax and that holds it very tightly there's no glue in there it can move about expand yeah. or Mushroom. whatever yeah. first of all there's a very heavy horsehair yeah. fishing line here this is uh, 21 hairs that's uh, three bunches of seven twisted uh, yeah. to make a little rope and then and then, then uh, there's another piece, and it's knotted together with a, 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 a knot that's still used today by, by anglers. It's called a water knot. But they knew what they were doing. I mean, these guys, because, you know, it was important that they, that they succeeded because uh, it was part of going shopping. It was going to get some grub. You know, they didn't go to the shops. They had to, had to get look after themselves. Just, yeah. The River Wye, running through Hatton Hall's estate, not only supplied the kitchen with fresh water, but also a constant supply of fresh brown trout. The brown trout's natural environment has been slowly eroded by yes. man's use of the waterways. Yes. So we're very lucky here at Haddon Hall to actually have a, a river that runs past that has got brown trout in it. But I'm not so sure if we're going to be so lucky to catch ourselves one. We will, but uh, probably not here. I think Might we've, we've scared away the fish that were just here. Um, they, they'll not have gone far, but they just won't eat. I mean, you, still you wouldn't up. eat if you were frightened, would you? If somebody was no. <laughs> threatening some nasty <laughs> Spaniard with a with a with a spit of sword was at your throat, you'd be you'd not be ready to eat a pork pie, would you? <laughs> but I'm always ready to eat a pork pie. <laughs> <laughs> so so I have to bring it. Oh, that's the problem. They're all over there by that yep, bank. Yeah. Anglers through the ages have learnt to their cost. They must not let the, uh, the fish see them. <laughs> well, shall we go and try another bit of river? Yes. Where we've not frightened <laughs> up the fish. <laughs> we'll try not to frighten them at the next spot. These are strawberries, wild strawberries, and these are the only sort of strawberries that uh, Tudors had. That the modern great big fat things, they're a hybrid between these and something that's found in America. Um, but whenever you see strawberries, just these little tiny little things, they're really lovely though, they're so sweet. I've seen accounts of gentlemen in London and they've kept sort of household accounts and uh, it says for their dinner that they had a pint of strawberries and a chicken, which would be pretty damn gorgeous, wouldn't you? I mean, think how many you'd need, it'd be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, wouldn't it? <laughs>